Hello there, I'm Black Bright, broadcasting out of the UK. And if this is the first time you're visiting my channel, like, subscribe and share. Um, we've been hearing a lot about the deportations in the US of A. Um, recently, I don't know how many took place on Sunday or if indeed it did take place, but I wanted to talk about deportation from the UK, which is not so broadcasted. I mean, Trump sends it out in his tweets and we hear it in the newspapers because of it. But the UK is a bit more surreptitious. They do things much more quietly. And we don't know what's going on over here, but we do know things are happening. Now, I was sent a video and um, this is the how the UK is doing it. No words or anything. <laughs> It's just on my WhatsApp. I know it's not good, but it's what's happening, isn't it? I know it's not good, but it's happening. I've never seen immigration in no other port. It's alright, it's on WhatsApp. You've got to get my number to see it. Hello. Hello. How are you? White people, them as well. You shouldn't racially profile, you know? They might also be illegal. See, they, these people over here, how come you're walking past them? Yeah, come on, these lot need questioning as well. Yeah, yeah, the questioning people. What? Say questioning people, Blair. The questioning people. Oh, the yard is look. Yeah, I'm not lying. Blatantly racially profiling people. They've come in the pub. I've never seen immigration in their next pub. Them, them, they are the door in case people are trying to run. They are the dead. They are the they are the exiting in case now illegal. I know, I know. The cover the pub just to buy some food, and all me know is immigration officers is everywhere. I need to hurry up and get my food and go before them deport me back. <laughs> I love the way she just switched. I think it's a bit like what I do. She's obviously, um, I don't know if she's born in Jamaica or here, but it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, is that the raids are going on in the UK as well. And very, um, like I said, very discreetly. I, that from her accent, I think she's in Birmingham. So they're raiding the pubs, the nightclubs, and that is what they're doing here. Now, when you're thinking about deportation, there's a lot of consequences to deportation, which is why I'm doing this video. Um, not everybody who is deported is a bad person. Technically, you should only be deported if you're convicted of a very serious crime. Otherwise, you should be removed. And people who have overstayed, they're eligible for removal, which is a less um, stigmatised crime. But what the police are doing is almost criminalising them so that they be, have to be deported. And I understand the concept behind that because once they're deported, they can't come back for 10 years. But they're not following legislation. You know, it's people who rape, people who murder, people who have done violent crimes, sex offenders. Those are the ones that they should be deporting, not people with, um, you know, um, minor crimes like small drug offences, driving offences and like having not having their passport or not being documented. They're not deportable offences, but they are deporting them all the same. Now, also what's happening is that some um, offenders, they get, they're entitled to legal counsel. And what's sometimes happening is, is that the legal counsel will tell them to plead guilty to maybe if they've got, if they've been found with drugs, to plead guilty and do a sentence. But they're not letting them know that as a result of doing a sentence that they can be deported. So a lot of people are also pleading guilty under the advice of the council and then not realizing that the only punishment isn't prison, it's also deportation.
And it's and what does deportation mean, especially if you spent most of your life in this country? It means exile because you're leaving what we what you would consider your home country to go somewhere else where you don't know. So um, I am going to read some stuff. I just wanted to give you a little background. Like I said, deportations are taking place in the UK, not as wide, not as widely known as in America, not as hyped up because, as you know, the Brits are very reserved and they do things very, very stealthily. So let's see. So deportation can be imposed on anyone who is not a citizen. So even if you've got your permanent residence, you can be deported. The only people who can't be deported are British citizens and not even and naturalised British citizens can be deported. It's the ones who are born on the soil who cannot be deported. It might be more difficult to um, deport a naturalised. I would imagine if they'd done a real serious crime, then they could find grounds to deport. But technically, as long as you're a citizen, you can't be deported. Uh, foreign nationals, oh, I've already said that. Well, the, well, let me read it anyway, because I don't like missing stuff, because you know what I find is I do these videos, I skip stuff, and then I think after I've done the video, oh, I should have said that. So I'm still going to go through it, even though I've mentioned it, okay? Um, foreign nationals often plead guilty to lesser offences on the advice of their solicitor, without realising the long-term consequences. Lawyers tend not to share or maybe do not realise that by admitting to a crime that the individual has the potential to be deported. The individual is likely to believe that the prison sentence is the full punishment for the crime. This is what I said earlier. Although difficult, such defendants must ask the court to withdraw the guilty plea on the basis that the attorney gave erroneous or insufficient advice regarding deportation consequences. However, defendants have minimal success in retracting a guilty plea, regardless of why they said it, because the onus in the end is on them. And you can imagine if you say you're guilty, OK, the lawyer is telling you to say you're guilty, but you need to have your own understanding. I mean, why would you admit to something that you haven't done? Just because a lawyer said something, a lawyer said it to you. I mean, a lot of lawyers do that. They say, oh, you know, you're better off taking a small sentence. And you end up ruining your life. So you really have to have the courage to stand firm. And not if you're not guilty, don't let any lawyer tell you to plead guilty. It's got far-reaching consequences, as you'll find out by the time I've ended this video. Um, so anyway, deportation rather than removal is the preferred option because it prevents the offender from returning for a minimum of 10 years. You are at risk of removal if you do not have any leave to remain in the UK and haven't applied for any. If your asylum or immigration application is refused or the leave you had has expired, under all those circumstances, you, are, you can be deported. But I hate that word. I hate that word deported because there's a stigma attached to it. They put you in shackles and they put you on a plane. And when you come off of that plane, it's degrading. It's embarrassing. So I don't know why. They have to put black people through that. I'm talking for black people. You know, I don't know about any other race, but I've seen it as far as black people are concerned. They shackle them as though they're bloody slaves back in the thing. I'm surprised they don't shackle them together and have them one behind the other with those chains on the bottom of their feet. You know, do what's right. OK, they've overstayed. They don't need to be deported. They can be removed. It's the same cost to the government. It's not anymore. It just means that they can go back to their country with a bit of dignity. And if you want to put some kind of clause in their passport that they don't return, do that. But don't deport them when they're not eligible for deportation. Um, 
since 2015, the Home Office has been able to inform someone they are liable to removal and then remove that person at any given point during a three-month removal window. This is a change from the former legal obligation of issuing removal directions, which would specify the date, time and flight number of the removal. Although the Home Office may still, in some cases, issue courtesy letters containing this information, there is no legal obligation to do so, apart from those cases where the removal window cannot be used, like when you've got family. The Home Office must give you notice if you're liable for removal and cannot lawfully remove you during this notice period. During this notice period, you... You may, a, you may be able to legally challenge the removal. Since that notice period is over, once that notice period is over, the three-month removal window begins and you can be removed without notice at any point during it. The removal window can be extended by 28 days if removal doesn't take place. For example, because of a delay in receiving a travel document, or booking escorts, and where the Home Office expects to be able to remove you within those additional 28 days. I think it's important that people know what the process of what actually happens with regard to deportation, um, because it does affect, it will affect a lot of people. And so at least if their families know in advance, they know what to expect and they know what they can do, whether or not that individual is entitled to, can, will successfully appeal. Basically, if they've spent time in jail over a year um, or technically it should be over four years for deportation, but they're still doing it if they've spent any time in jail. So, but technically, legally, it should be over four years before deportation because um, four years implies that the crime is serious. And so it's serious crimes that warrant deportation. Um, the ones for one year, 18 months, they're lesser crimes. And yes, they can be removed, but it doesn't carry the stigma of deportation. But they're just sticking everybody in the same boat and deporting them. Um, the general notice period is seven cal calendar days if you are not detained or just 72 hours if you are detained. The 72 hours must include at least two working days. The last 24 hours must include a working day unless the notice period already includes three working days. If a deportation order has been made against you, you will be issued with notice of deportation arrangements. And this should be in keeping with the removal notice period above. To prevent your deportation, you need to prove that it would breach your rights under the Refugee Convention of Human Rights Convention. And you know how difficult that is. That's all to do with you having family, um, Article 8, all that kind of stuff. It's really, really difficult to prove. What they're saying is the family should go with you. Um, so the immigration rules are now weighted very much in favour of deporting a person after a criminal sentence. The rules state that if you were sentenced for more than 12 months, your deportation is conducive to the public good and in the public interest. Let me do over here. Um, the rules also say that your deportation, oh, so just said that, if your offending caused serious harm as determined by the Home Office, or you are a persistent offender who shows particular disregard for the law, irrespective of how long you were sentenced for. So, you know, like if you've had a series of small offences, could be robbery, could be shoplifting, but you've done three or four of them. I think it's up to three or four, they'll, con they'll call that um, persistent offender. You can be deported for that, even though they're small offences. If you're liable to deportation, your spouse or civil partner and or your child, if they are under 18, are also liable to be deported unless they have settled status in the UK in their own right or have been living apart from you. 
So if you have a spouse or you have children and they're not documented and you're up for deportation, they're going to be deported as well. So you have to bear that in mind. Um, if you were sentenced to more than four years, the Home Office guidance says you will need to have very compelling circumstances. Very compelling. Now, you know that is extraordinarily compelling because I know that they didn't allow somebody when their mother was dying. And if that's not a compelling circumstance, I don't know what is. I don't know what a compelling, I don't know what constitutes compelling circumstances. In order for a deportation order not to be made or to be revoked, I think even if you have a terminal illness, if you've still got maybe six months to live, they'll still deport you. Don't quote me on that, but I heard something about something like that, but I'm not sure. Okay, so um, let me see. Remember, however, that the court may have a different, more generous interpretation of what counts as those circumstances than the Home Office. So sometimes when it goes to court, the court might have a different view, depending on the reasons. They might be a bit more lenient. Don't know. But like I said, in order to reach the court, you need money. If you ain't got money... And the only way it's worth investing in a lawyer is if you really believe you have a case. Now, if you are a, if you are only an overstayer, technically you're not eligible for deportation. So you know, if you you could argue that you know you could be removed, you could appeal against deportation because this is the stigma about deportation that's the bad thing and also with deportation it takes so many of your civil rights away i'm going to let you know what they are but you know once you're deported it's like this big weight hanging over you can't even travel anywhere you're unable to get a work because it, it implies that you're a criminal and so you've got all of that unless you're witty enough and resourceful enough to start your own business you're totally screwed so, if you've been sentenced for less than four years, but more than 12 months, or your offending is deemed to fall into the causing serious harm category described above, the immigration rules say that deportation would be proportionate, except if deportation would be in breach of your Article 8 rights to family and private life. Um, if you have a child under 18 in the UK, you have a genuine and subsisting parental relationship with your child. Your child is a British citizen or has lived in the UK for at least seven years immediately prior to the decision to deport you. It would be unduly harsh for your child to live in the country to which you will deport it. And it would be unduly harsh for your child to remain in the UK without you. You would have to have some serious arguments in favour of all of those in order for them to stay the deportation. You know, so um, it shouldn't be hard to prove, but you know, I think they bank on, you know, families, especially black families, not sticking together. They bank on single families. They bank on the father not being around. They bank on the father not having a relationship with the child. That's what they bank on. But if you can show how involved you are, and you know how they expect you to do that, because when you um, when you have children, that you get child benefit. And the way they can see whether or not you've been caring for that child and you have been supporting that child and you are with that child is to show that the, that money has gone into a bank account for that child. If it hasn't, they're going to say that you don't have that child's in best interest at heart. They've got lots of ways of proving whether or not you have been a good parent, whether it's a male or a female. And if you cannot show that that money has been put aside, all those child benefit payments have been put aside for that child, they're going to consider that that child can manage without you in the country.
I was talking to somebody at work and they said every they got three kids. Well, the, the lady's expecting a third one now. And she said every single penny goes into their separate bank accounts. But she said because it's her third child and the government is not giving money for the third child anymore, she's not sure how that child is going to, you know, it's almost unfair that the first two have been able to accumulate the child benefit, but this one won't be because the government isn't paying for a third child. So she's going to have to put that in so that all, ch all three children are treated the same. And those are the kind of things that they are looking for from parents to show that you have a subsisting relationship with them. Um, or you have a genuine and subsisting relationship with a partner who is in the UK and is a British citizen or settled in the UK. And the relationship was formed at a time when you were in the UK lawfully and your immigration status was not precarious, which means you were in a relationship with somebody who's a British national. You And at that time, you, you're, you hadn't overstayed your visa. You were legally in the country and you can prove that. Uh, and it would be unduly harsh for your partner to live in the country to which you are being deported, being a compelling circumstances over and above very significant, sorry, significant difficulties which would be faced by you and your partner in continuing your family life together outside the UK and which could not be overcome would entail very serious hardship for you and your partner and it would be unduly harsh for your partner to remain in the UK without you. So basically what they're saying, if the country you're going to has got no, say it's got no water, no electricity, you know, you, there's nowhere for you to live, you can't get jobs for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe you're old or something, I don't know what the reason might be and so it would be unduly harsh for you to take out your British citizen spouse or partner and, and take them to that country, then that would be considered a serious hardship. But also, once again, you would have to prove that you've had a subsisting relationship. How do you do that? They expect that you, to, you for you to have joint bank accounts. They expect you to have joint bills. They expect your name to be, both of your names to be on mortgage documents, lease documents, all of those things. That's what they expect if you are claiming that you are in a subsisting relationship with somebody in the UK. You can't just say, oh, I've been living with her for five years and, you know, this and that. That's not enough. They need to know, they need to see evidence of both of your names on all of the documents. So this isn't something willy-nilly. This is something serious. Um... The Home Office guidance says that you must provide original, independent and verifiable documentary evidence of all these factors. Well, that's basically what I was just saying. Um, remember that the Home Office is likely to take a very restricted view on who meets the circumstances above and a judge in court may not agree. The Home Office cannot dictate to the immigration rules exactly what Article 8 means and what would be a disproportionate breach for every case. A judge may find that even if you don't meet the requirements of the immigration rules, you would suffer a disproportionate breach of your Article 8 rights if you were deported. So what they're saying is, it's depending on your circumstances, you might be lucky but you would have to have some really, really solid evidence, solid. And you know, a lot of us, we don't keep that kind of evidence. We just take so much for granted. You could be in a relationship with somebody for 10, 15, 20 years. You just come in, you fling two, you live, fling 20 pound, not 20 pound, you, you fling maybe a couple of hundred quid to your partner for the shopping and the groceries and the bills. And you know, you might be doing that since for the whole 30 years you might have been doing that. But there's nothing concrete to prove it. There's nothing to show it. Unless, it's, unless you've been depositing that into her bank account, there's nothing to show that the two of you had a subsisting relationship. Likewise, if a woman has moved in with a man who's a British national, if she can't show that she's been contributing to the mortgage or the rent or the bills by depositing the same amount of money in his account every month, she's not going to stand a chance either. 
So this deportation thing is real. Um, overstaying is it's not by itself deportable offence, but a removable, removable offence, like I said. That is why overstayers must be criminalised in some way so that they become eligible for deportation. And that's like I said, you know, a lot of overstayers, in and of itself, it's not a deportable offence. But if the police can add something to it, you know, like aggravated assault, if they if you try to fight them, if you try to resist arrest, if they find, you know, weed on you or ganja or any other drugs, if they find, you know, if, you know, well, if driving offences are not deportable, but they can use it as an excuse, you know, to show that you're not an abiding citizen, a law-abiding citizen. They can find anything unless you're squeaky, free, squeaky clean. They can use anything in anything they can think of to criminalize you if they want to deport you and that's what they do so if it's something small it might not warrant um deportation but they don't care as long as you've done as long as you've been convicted of a crime and they can make you do time for it that's all they need that's enough justification to deport you because deportation is at their discretion. They don't, a lot of them, they don't go by legislation. They just make their own rules up as they go along. But like I said, overstaying in and of itself is not a deportable offence. And you should not be treated like a criminal. Um, so... They can make also make you look like for when oh yeah another thing you know if they're looking to make you look criminal they can make you look like a fraud you know they can get all your papers out you know are there any inconsistencies is anything that you said inconsistent and they can have you for perjury um, yeah and if, you know these people they might have some weed on them and then they can say they're drug dealers and drug trafficking minister society they can use anything but they need to criminalise you to deport you. That's the most important thing. Um, being convicted of a criminal carries many consequences, which is what I said at the beginning, apart from deportation and is what is known as civil disability. It is where a condition of a person who has had legal right or privilege revoked as a result of a criminal conviction. You know, in America, um, when when you've had a conviction, you don't have right to vote and you don't have right to a gun. And you know all those black people who they have in the prisons, none of them, if they were to come out, has a right to have a gun. And you have all these white people around with guns. And so the black people are defenceless. But that's one way of stopping them from be getting, being armed by criminalising them. Um, okay, so what they... Um, so what is revoked as a result of a criminal offence? Your public rights. Um, apparently, on the premise that violation of the criminal law indicates a general lack of respect for law and for the obligations of citizenships, um, you can... What's this? They've barred former offenders from participating in a number of public activities normally open to citizens. I don't know what those activities are apart from voting. The right to citizenship. The Home Office has the right to revoke naturalised citizenships for crimes, including breach of immigration rules. So, or even when you're just out of the country for more than two years, they can, well, not necessarily, well, it is a kind of a deportation if they revoke your passport, because you won't be able to come back in. And they can do that if you're out of the country for more than two years if they want they can just say look you're not coming back um oh i was watching this um video Rupert Cropper, and there's a boy he was born in the he was born in the uk his parents had taken him to jamaica they dumped him with somebody who was not a relative um i believe he's 17 now and he wanted to know whether or not he could come back to the uk now Somebody like him, like I was talking before, he would have had to have spent his initial, I think it's up to 10 years, continuously in this country 
in order to qualify and get his British citizenship. He can't be in Jamaica from the age, he, I think he went there when he was one, from the age of one and now he's a teenager and then come back to the UK and claim British citizenship. It doesn't work like that. We also didn't know the nationality of his parents, which makes a big difference. If they were both born in the UK, then yeah, and he's got his paperwork. If they're both born in the UK, he is entitled to be a British citizen. It, well, he is a British citizen. If, if the both parents are British, and if that's the case, he can come over if he can find them. But I don't believe he can find his parents. But I don't know what it would say. That's one thing it doesn't say on the pass on on the birth certificate. It just gives you the um, names of the parents. It doesn't give you. Does it give you their nationality? I think it does give you their nationality. So their nationality should be on that passport. And if they're British, you know, and he knows where they are, he's he has every right to come back to the UK. Um, what else? This is nearly finished. It's really gone on long, I know. Ever so sorry. The right to vote. The right to vote is probably the single most important politically right held by a citizen. So yet so many of us fail to vote because a lot of times we just think it's a waste of time. Um, but a criminal, convicted criminal will lose his right to vote. A right to hold public office, I'm not sure whether or not many of us would want to do that, but you lose that right. Judicial rights, you lose that if convicted or prison or imprisoned for certain offences. The individual will not have the right to appear in court, represent his own interests, testify in court, be a witness or serve on a jury, because the assumption is that criminals are not trustworthy or credible. A juror must have good character. Evidence of a conviction may be sufficient to result in disqualification. And you can understand that. A criminal conviction may prevent the offender from holding a court-appointed position of trust, from serving as an executor of a will or admi administrator of an estate. I never knew that. If for a will, you can't have somebody who's had a criminal offence to execute your will. So they're really not giving that person a second chance. They're assuming that just because um, they've got they've had a criminal offence that they're not going to execute that will fairly. Well, it just shows you what a criminal conviction. They call this collateral damage because not only have you done the crime, you've gone into prison. Not only have you been deported, but this is the collateral damage. This is, these are all the other things how they affect your life just because you've got a criminal offence and because you've been deported. So it's, it's, it's not a walk in the park. Um, what else is there? Registration. Persons convicted of sexual offences will need to register their address with the police after they've been released from prison. And of course, we all know employment is hard to get a job when you're a convicted criminal. Um, being, com being convicted of a felony is a serious event with lifelong consequences. Um, and it has a lifelong lasting impact on a person's life. It results in the loss of basic civil rights described. So it's not just a jail sentence, it's a life of exile if you consider the UK your home. So be careful what you admit to if you're held by police. Um, there's an example in the United States, um, it's the United States versus Del Rosario. Counsel told him to plead guilty for possession of drugs with intent to distribute, even though it wasn't the case. He was told he would get a short sentence, but was not told that the consequence of that guilty plea would lead to deportation. People who have literacy problems rely on counsel to give good advice, but sometimes counsel gives wrong advice does not have the client's best interests at heart, especially when they are pro bono clients. You know, the solicitors who work for free um, as for public interest or, you know, they get other work through that, the paid work. So, yeah, in America, an individual can get deported if she is convicted of crime involving moral turpitude within five years of entering the country or spends time in jails in excess of one year. Moral turpitude is a legal concept in the United States and some other countries that refers to an act or behaviour that gravely violates the sentiment or accepted standard of the community, e.g., um, 
murder, voluntary manslaughter, kidnapping, robbery, gross indecency, serious and aggravated assaults. However, foreign nationals are being deported just for, for being foreign and unable to prove their legitimacy for one reason or another. So that's it, folks. You've had a crash course in deportation. And I hope you found this useful. Bye-bye.